Good morning. I'm very happy that finally I can participate in the Qatar conference. And I, first of all, would like to uh, thank all the organizers, and especially, of course, Chris, for inviting me. It's a big honor to be able to speak here today. Um, and what I would like to do is to tell a little bit about a new project. And when I say a new project, I would like to emphasize it's new because I'm just exploring things. I have not yet been working on this for many years. So I don't feel very sure and secure about what I'm going to say. So what I'm trying to do is to present some ideas and speak as little as possible and then have a debate. You know, because many people here will have ideas about precisely that topic. So the topic is actually, as you will see on the handout, uh, I changed a little bit the topic, and in fact, I called it discourse, knowledge, power, and politics, uh, which is indeed the kinds of things uh, we talk about. And we already know from Foucault ages ago that knowledge and discourse have a lot to do with power. Uh, and if there's one crucial notion in critical discourse analysis, obviously, it's the notion of power and how power is being abused. Now, that, of course, is central. And I would like to link that up with the notion of, uh, of knowledge, which is a new project. Actually, it continues a project which I finally, after many years, uh, finished last year, um, a project on context which I thought I would work on for the summer, a few months, because I had some idea about what was good and what was wrong in the theory of context, and I think I will do that right, and I'll write this book in one summer, and that's it. It took me five years to write those big book on context finally, which is in fact now two books which will come out. The first one, more or less this week, with Cambridge University Press, simply called Discourse in Context, uh, which of course makes good uh, on a book which I wrote 30 years ago called Text in Context, which speaks a lot about text and hardly says anything about context, only very formal things. So the theory of context was something which was still on the agenda for many, many years, um, and it was much more difficult than I thought, because context is practically everything uh, which is not text. So in order to manage precisely um, what is context and what everything else is there, uh, obviously one has to have a pretty good theory what people usually take as a context and which they don't. Now, part of this theory of context, of course, also, apart from participants and their roles and their positions and their power relationships and their, go and their goals and their uh, identities and so on and so on, and settings and time and location and so on, you all know that. Um, there is one element in the context which is crucial, namely the knowledge of the participants. Which is obvious because also at this moment, in each sentence I'm saying I have to think what do they know already? What can I presuppose to be known? Now, that particular kind of strategy in everyday life, in every kind of discourse, that is true not only in, in speech uh, or in a lecture, but also in everyday conversation. People have to adapt constantly to what other people know. So they have to have some idea of this knowledge, and you cannot see it, you cannot read it, you simply have to assume how this works. Now, one of the problems of a theory of the relationship between discourse and knowledge is how do these strategies, how do these moves of people work, what is the management of knowledge people have in everyday conversation, in lectures, in scientific articles and so on. So I would like to explore this whole interface between on the one hand discourse and on the other hand knowledge. Since I only have, let's say, 40 minutes or so to present this and then have a discussion, I cannot do many things. I mean, I cannot present everything we know in psychology or knowledge, everything we know in epistemology or knowledge, everything we know in social psychology or knowledge, which is huge. I mean, both fields, discourse and the field of knowledge, are enormous fields which are also the object of whole disciplines like epistemology. So, obviously, um, there is an enormous amount of things to read and to digest. And, of course, this idea of doing a book on discourse and knowledge will not be something I even think of doing in one summer. This, again, will be many, many years and to explore things. Um, before I talk a little bit more about discourse and knowledge, let me just 
say a little bit about discourse studies and clinical discourse studies in general, because there are so many misunderstandings. Um, first of all, I have to emphasize that for me at least, discourse studies, critical discourse studies, is not a method. Critical discourse studies is not a theory. And I say that because so many people who send papers also for the journals say we are going to apply the method of critical discourse analysis. For me there is no such thing. Critical discourse analysis for me is like a movement. It's a movement of critical scholars. It's like just a movement of people who are politically and socially engaged in the work they do. Uh, and they will use, of course, all the methods we know in various domains and schools of discourse analysis. Uh, these may be just systematic conversational text analysis, it may be rhetorical analysis, but also it may be all the methods we have of the social sciences, like for different kinds of participant observations, interviewing, and so on and so on. So any kind of method which is relevant for the goals of the, of the research is for me at least, part of critical discourse studies. So critical discourse studies, again, is not a method or a theory, it's just a movement. And it uses any kind of method or theory you can find in discourse analysis, in linguistics, in the social sciences, in psychology and so on. It depends on the aims of, of, the, of the research. It depends on the context, how much money you have, how, ma how many participants you have to do the research and so on. It's just also a very practical thing. Obviously, if you have 2,000 news articles to analyze, you cannot do a detailed analysis of all the microstructures of the issue. You have to do something else. It depends on the, uh, on the aims, on the data, on how many people and money you have. It depends on many, many things. Now, that I would like to say about critical discourse analysis in general. Then about my view of discourse studies also changes constantly. I mean, you just mentioned text grammar. For me, that's another life. It's just a long, long time ago and also because the ideas we then had about text was to extend sentence grammars and to talk about the real text and talk. Um, and of course that was not just people in discourse, uh, text grammar, but also many other disciplines. Also in pragmatics, coming up in social linguistics with the work of Bill above and so on and so on. So that was just one position. But now after more than 30 years, I think so many things have happened in discourse analysis that I would now say that my general way of talking about this is also today is always multidisciplinary. I will not be member of a sect, not even of critical discourse analysis. I will not be member of just one line of, of research. I think the only way of critical discourse analysis, as I see, is to be open, to be dynamic and to, th to integrate any good idea which comes from any, anywhere. That's very important. But I have three main points I always try to do when I can. And I try to do that in the ideology book I wrote nearly 10 years ago, and I've done that also now in these two big volumes of context. I try to relate three main areas of research. Obviously, first discourse, language use and discourse, text, talk, and so on. In the way you all know it. One. Second. Uh, society at all levels of analysis. So first of all, of course, because discourse and, and, and talk and text is situated, so we have to talk about the situation. Now, in my theory of context, I speak to whole volumes about what this situation actually is, what is part of it and what is not. Why is you as linguist, discourse analyst part of it, and for example, the color of the seats, no. It's part of the social situation, but it's not part of the community of the situation. So we need a theory of the situation, not just an idea, but a proper theory. And not just a situation at hand, but also that we are in a university, that we talk about academic life, that we have lectures which function and so on. So much of the things I say now, you understand as a lecture and not as sales talk or as ideological indoctrination, but all, all kinds of other things which have to do not only with the local situation, but also something which is much more <coughs> macro, much more global. How do people do that? The question is how do this big thing like academic life, movements in scholarship, how does it impinge on what I say and how you understand what I say? How do we do that? Now what I proposed in these books on context is that this is not a direct relationship as we know it from social linguistics. It's not that social structure 
or social situation in which we talk impinge directly on what people say or how we understand it. It is something which they construe, it is something which they define, it's something which they actively do. When speaking, they also think. They simply construe things and they define things, as we know from the old uh, slogan in, in sociology 50, 60 years ago, that people define the situation as they see it. So a context is not objectively there, but is relevant only when they speak and understand in the way they define it. And the technical notion we use, as you know, for that is a mental model. It doesn't, I don't care about the mental model, system. as long as you know that's a construction of the participants, a definition of the participants, which they don't say. They know that everybody does so. So you cannot study them directly, you have to do so through indirect means. All right? But important is that each of you at this moment have a definition of this situation. Someone giving a lecture at a conference. That's what your definition of the situation is, I hope. You know, that's very important. So in my way of organizing what I'm going to say, how you understand me is dependent, everything, on how you define the situation. It, it explains my style, it explains my, my way of explaining things, it explains everything. So in the old theory, you mentioned with Walter Kinch, we didn't have that. We just had mental models of what you talk about. You know, like a newspaper article about this morning, an accident, that's what you talk about. People and the journalists have a mental model about this particular accident. But what was not in the book 20 years ago, and what we do now integrate, is the following. That for the journalist to write this newspaper article, he or she also must have a mental model of him himself or herself as a journalist writing for the newspaper and for different newspapers you write a different story about the same event. So the mental model about the event, the personal subjective interpretation or definition of the situation you talk about is the same. But when you talk to friends or you write for different news for different newspapers, you as a function of this mental model you have of yourself as a journalist for this newspaper. You write it in a different way. You tell the story in a different way. All right? So that is important. In the theory, we have now have a new fundamental thing that not only we have a mental model of what they talk about, the semantics, but you also have a mental model of in which we, the situation in which we speak, which you could simply call a pragmatic model. All right? So the pragmatic model controls what we say and how we say it. That's fundamental. Now, part of this mental model is what the participants know about each other's knowledge. All right, and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, now let me briefly summarize what we know in different disciplines about not many things going on, of course. First of all, in epistemology, of course, that is a lot, 2,000 or more years of tradition in epistemology. And we'll come back to that in a little moment. Um, in psychology, the problem of, of, of epistemology is that they are not, they talk about knowledge a lot, but they are not really interested in discourse. They sometimes talk about language, but it's something, knowledge something abstract. You know, we really don't know whether it's knowledge of real people uh, speaking and communicating in real ways and how they get this kind of knowledge, how they use it in everyday life. So it's a very decontextualized, non discursive approach to knowledge as something very abstract. Secondly, of course, in psychology, there's lots of work, of course, in, in psychology on, on, on knowledge. We know about scripts and frames and, and knowledge organization, and we know in, in artificial intelligence about knowledge engineering. There's an enormous amount of work in these disciplines about knowledge. Much of this work is not really also interested in real speakers in everyday real situations, like real students or real teachers and so on. It's not really what cognitive psychology does. And also many of the people are not really interested in this course. So again, it's something only cognitive, something you, you study in the, lab, in the lab, and it's something which has to do with the minds of people, but it's not really contextualized, it's not part of this course. Uh, in sociology, as you well know, we have a sociology of knowledge. We have a sociology of science and so on. That does uh, have to do with the role of knowledge in society, but again, much of this work is not really discourse analytical. So again, the way to study that is not through the, the ways we are really interested in, in discourse. 
uh, analysis. And then of course we have social psychology with again many forms of social psychology are not really interested in discourse analysis uh, but in all kinds of other things, typical social psychological notions, attitudes and so on traditionally. Um, and also many people in social psychology are not really interested in knowledge. Most, if you look in how many studies are in, in social psychology or knowledge, there's really very little. The funny thing is that if there's one notion which should be a central notion in social psychology rather than attitudes, and so it's knowledge. Now only uh, in discursive psychology there's lots of work which is both on knowledge and which is both on discourse. So there's just one exception in social psychology which but does pay attention to both discourse and also to knowledge. Only they do it in a way a little bit different from me, because they are really more interested in the way it's being formulated, expressed, and so how you can study it, than as some kind of mental construct, as I would do say so. For example, in line with people in cognitive science and, and neuroscience. Now, this is a little bit of the background of the different approaches you have in different disciplines. Now, let me just say a little bit about this notion of, of knowledge itself. The classical notion, the classical definition of knowledge in epistemology uh, is usually uh, defined in terms of what they call justified true beliefs. Justified true beliefs. So if you go, it goes back to a long way, Plato, Plato, and so on. Justified true beliefs. So most of the discussion and then much of the debating in current epistemology is whether this definition is correct. And there are some strange counterexamples which say, no, it's not really true. These famous Gettier young examples for people who know about uh, epistemology. This is all very, very, you know, armchair philosophy uh, and armchair epistemology. And I don't think it's very interesting. Actually, the influence of this particular kind of epistemology in other disciplines is practically zero. No one reads this kind of things, and it's very, very boring, I think. <laughs> But, of course, there are 2,000 years of philosophy and they are not just idiots who, I mean, they have thought about many fundamental things. And we better learn from it anywhere. In discourse analysis, psychology and so on, we should read each other much more than we actually do. And I think we should do this here too. So my proposal when I talk about knowledge is not in terms of these abstract, justified true beliefs. Because first of all, I think the notion of truth is not relevant here. And I say this against Alvin Goldman, a famous epistemologist, for him, for him it's still very important that we talk about truth. And truth, again, is one of these abstract philosophical notions which people don't use in everyday life. And I use a different kind of notion of knowledge which is much more pragmatic. It's much more to do with everyday life, how people define it in everyday life. So for me, knowledge is, first of all, beliefs people share. Knowledge is always something that has to do with, you know, with communities, if with groups of people. I call them knowledge communities, epistemic communities. Knowledge, I'm talking only now about social knowledge. That's one thing. And secondly, <clears throat> obviously it's not kind of any kind of beliefs, because also religious beliefs, prejudices are what people share. You know, somehow that is not usually called knowledge, and every, in also in everyday life, and not only philosophy, people make a distinction between mere beliefs, and what people actually know. So there must be something different. And the difference is not in terms of truth or not truth, but what in each epistemic community is taken as the criteria or standards of accepting beliefs as knowledge. I'm not saying accepting is true, because true is not a notion I, I say of beliefs. Beliefs may be expressed, have a relationship with the world, if you like, but it's not something that's true or false. I mean, statements are true or false, and only assertions are, you know, so not, beliefs are not true or false. So, they just are generally shared within epistemic community beliefs, which are somehow validated by the standards or criteria of each epistemic community. And they're different for different kinds of epistemic communities. It's different 500 years ago from today. It's different in everyday life, where we say, oh, I know, because John told me. That's enough. Or I've seen it. That's enough. In science, you need something else, obviously. So in epistemic communities like science, you have different kinds of criteria, which are called methods. And each epistemic community, at each place, and each culture has a different way of defining what for them is knowledge. Many things which other people call knowledge, or what they call knowledge in, in medieval times, for us are just mere beliefs, 
or prejudices or superstitions and so on. It simply depends on an epistemic community. Now this kind of relativism, many people in epistemology don't accept. They simply say, no, we always want to strive for really what is true. Therefore people continue to search and so on and so on. And I say, no, it always depends on that particular kind of epistemic community and its standards and criteria. And that's also true in everyday conversations. It's true everywhere. And also when we later to have a look at what um, is being used as knowledge, for example, in a parliamentary debate, namely when Tony Blair is defending his motion to go to war against Iraq five years ago, then he uses, of course, what for him is knowledge, and other people say no. So we have, we'll have a look a little bit about this example to see how it's being done. <coughs> Within this theory of knowledge, which we try to apply in, in discourse analysis and also in critical discourse analysis, first of all, we should make a distinction between different kinds of knowledge, which is neither done in cognitive psychology very much, nor in many other disciplines, but there are all kinds of different knowledge. First of all, we have social knowledge, pers personal knowledge. We have a social different kind of... You have local knowledge, you have urban knowledge, you have knowledge... It depends what you... Um, in each of these communities take for granted or presuppose. So the kind of knowledge you know and have to have in order to be able to be, as I did this morning, the guardian, is fundamental. If you are not living in Britain, then you think you simply don't understand why, because this particular aspect of knowledge is missing. Many other things, you know, when it talks about the president or war or Iraq, we know that internationally, so you could call this general, international, even universal knowledge, for example, when we talk about my body. But many other things are typical, more national knowledge, or even local knowledge, or even you know, city knowledge, and even sometimes family knowledge. All right? So, you have all these different kinds of epistemic communities, and we have a very nice, let's say, empirical criteria for the definition of this particular kind of knowledge. It's not something, again, which is just purely abstract, nor purely mental and some psychology. We, we have also some kind of discursive criterion, and the discursive criterion is very, very easy. Anything which is being pre presupposed in the discourses of a community, we call knowledge. All right? Because it doesn't have to be stated. Anything which I don't tell today is simply presupposed. I assume that you know. All right? It's a very easy issue. It's a little bit complicated, all kinds of yes and buts and so on, but it's a practical definition. Anything which is presupposed in this course is not, sorry, is knowledge of an epistemic unit. Now, that makes it a very hard thing to study, because if knowledge is not being expressed in this course, how can you study it? So if I want to do today epistemic discourse analysis and even critical epistemic discourse analysis, how can I actually study the, the, the knowledge being, you know, which is behind the text, which is part of the context? And since contexts are not formulated most of the time, but simply presupposed to be known by the participants, you know, everyone here knows that we are in a room, that I'm giving a talk, that you're listening, that you're professors and students, all that kind of thing. No one has to formulate. I don't have to formulate. I simply presuppose it. And one of the things I presuppose is everything you know. I don't have to explain what discourse is. I don't have to explain what grammar is. I simply assume you know. Okay? So, how do you study this? So, that's an important thing. So, it goes through all kinds of indirect means. You know, there will be, there will be man indirect manifestations. Sometimes, when there's a problem, people will say, I know so and so. So, I remember, not for this particular paper. Uh, but for another paper, also on Tony Blair, uh, I studied systematically all the expressions of knowledge Tony Blair used in this particular kind of, uh, particular kind of debate. And the interesting thing is that you usually only use the word know when people doubt about your knowledge, or when it's not sure that you know, and when you're lying. You know? Because when you know things, you take it simply for granted that people assume and so on. So that's interesting. So as soon as people start to say, I know so-and-so, you know that they don't know, or you know <laughs> that there is something wrong. That's important. <clears throat> now, let me, without this uh, 
after this definition of knowledge, let me just say a few words about epistemic discourse analysis. One of the first things, of course, as we know, and that is just in the book with Kinch and a million other books and articles afterwards, is in order to produce text and talk, and in order to understand discourse, you have to know an enormous amount of things. You just have to have an enormous amount of knowledge of the world. And actually, also for introductory students, I usually say discourse actually is some kind of tip of the, ice, tip of the iceberg. Most of what we understand of a discourse is not expressed at all. It is something that people infer by implication, implicatures, you know, all kinds of things which simply are not being said in discourse but is being presupposed. Now, we know already more than 25 years, actually much more than that, from work in artificial intelligence by many others that in order to understand and produce you know, a fragment of discourse, we have this enormous amount of knowledge that people activate and they know that other people activate it. So when I'm speaking, I have this constant activation, I know that they know and you don't have to explain it. That's very fundamental. Otherwise, my discourse, if I would be totally explicit, for example, in established coherence, it would be much longer and much more complicated. So one of the most fundamental findings, I think, of cognitive psychology, and especially artificial intelligence of the 70s was that discourse can only be produced and understood when there are vast, amount, vast amounts of, of knowledge of the world. That's one thing. Of course, then the next question is, what is the structure of this knowledge of the world and how does it affect? Well, why do some kinds of knowledge work in this way and other kinds of this way? So this is an important thing. The second thing, which is a little bit less, relevant because it has to be direct with text and talk and not being discussed so much in psychology, at least not in cognitive psychology, is a thing I just mentioned. This particular kind of management of knowledge in everyday conversations and in you know, lectures. How do people know what other people know? Now, most of you know millions of things, right? Million. You have learned your whole life all the things you know from that little. You know what chairs are, what people are, presidents are, wars are, Parliament, and so you know millions of things. You also know many things which you have never thought about. Each one of you knows, without having thought it ever, that Bush has a belly button. <laughs> right or not? You know that, but you never thought about it. So not only you know many things explicitly, but you also know many things by simple inference. So you know which, and it doesn't have to be said. So you can talk in a text in a definite sense, with a definite outcome, the belly button of Bush, without ever introducing it explicitly. All right? So many of the things you know simply have never been taught, taught or learned, but you simply infer it from other knowledge. So there's millions of things. Now, when I have to take into account, as part of my context model, which makes my talk appropriate or not, all the knowledge I have, do I have to have these millions of things in my context model, in my definition of the situation? Now, that's very difficult because these context models have to be, you know, in many seconds and be construed and updated constantly. How do I know? So I need very fast, easy strategies to have an idea about your knowledge. Now, we do have these kind of things, and one of the things I try to do also in this book on context is the following, that I say, no, we don't have a list of knowledge people have. We simply use easy strategies. One of the things I say is simply, we are all members of the same epistemic community. For example, of lingu or linguists or psychology of discourse analysts. Everything which I know, they know. That's easy. It's very simple. The same thing reading the newspaper, a journalist writing for The Guardian, simply thinks, okay, everything I know about Britain, in general, they know and don't have to explain. So that's a very easy study. You don't have to have a list of millions of things. You simply say, well, I know, they know. And only the new things, for example, when you write the news and so on, you have to explain what they are. So you, you only have to add something new, or for example, what has been said recently in a conversation. And you may somehow activate it by recalling or reminding people. You say, you remember the guy told, told you about yesterday, which means you simply reactivate, you simply remind person of recent new knowledge you have. And so look at all this. Now, what I'm really interested in is one of the things is the everyday strategies in talk people use in this management of knowledge. Now, there are basically three things. Either you presuppose knowledge, or you assert new knowledge, or you recall or remind knowledge which probably people have, but might have forgotten. For example, if you read in the newspaper 
uh, as we reported last week, and so it, it helps people to remind what they have read a week ago. And the same thing in everyday conversation, as I just mentioned, people say, oh, uh, you remember the guy I talked to you yesterday. It simply reactivates these kind of things. Now, um, before I go to these examples, uh, let me just mention a few aspects of this course where this knowledge analysis, this epistemic analysis, is very important. One of the things I already mentioned, which is local and global coherence. As we all know from much uh, other work, is that we establish relationship between the propositions of a discourse uh, through all kinds of bridging inferences, through knowledge which has to be activated constantly. So if you do a real coherence analysis from proposition to proposition, you'll find all kinds of gaps all the time. So you need knowledge activated constantly to fill these gaps. Now this will be general knowledge of the world on one hand, and on, on the other hand not just general knowledge of the world, but also specific knowledge about the specific situation which you generate on the basis of the general knowledge. So when we know about civil wars and about armies and about destruction and about invasions, about Iraq, and there is a newspaper article about a bomb attack in Baghdad, many of the things you can construe from this general information will be about this mental model of, of a specific kind of event which happens. And the news will be about that. And much of the information in the news will not be Sorry, much of the information, the mental model you have to understand or to produce that particular kind of text is not in the text itself. Why? Because again, people can infer it from the general model, as we know. So, a mental model of the event the journalist has, or we have as readers of the newspaper, is much more complete than the actual news article. The news article is again just the tip of the iceberg, just necessary what you need to construe what it's all about. <laughs> what we call the interpretation of the discourse, or in psychological term, the mental model, whatever you like, it doesn't matter. But it means, you know, how we assign an interpretation to the text is much bigger than what the text, text itself does, and this is only possible because we have these enormous amounts of knowledge which we apply to this situation. So local and global coherence can only be established through these enormous amounts of knowledge. Secondly, of course, all the things which have to do with implications and presuppositions. Presuppositions and implications you can't see. If you, do, if you are really a positivist and say we only look at what we can see, then all these enormous amounts of meanings, implications, implicatures, presuppositions, things which are taken for granted, you can't study. So, in my view, therefore, you should go beyond the text itself and you should do much more than just the analysis of what is being said, which is the only thing you have, but we know that people understand much more than what is explicitly said. So for a good systematic study of implications and implications, you need much more than just the text. Also, for the study of evidentiality, you also well know, it has to do with the sources of knowledge. People say all the time, I just read it in the newspaper, I know so and so, because John told me and so on and so on. So there's a systematic study of evidentiality. It's also one of the relationships between discourse and knowledge. Now, I mean, where the knowledge comes from, or your opinions come from, but somehow people signal very often as a form of motivation, legitimation, as a form of, you know, showing that the knowledge they have is, you know, reliable, and that they are credible persons. They show, they say, oh, I just read on the internet, I just read the newspaper, I just saw a Wikipedia and so on and so on. I mean, this is what people do all the time, it's one of the relationships between discourse and knowledge. Of course, the same thing with argumentation. Much of the arguments in everyday life have all kinds of implicit arguments. Why? Because they're based on general knowledge, which is not being made explicit, but people simply use these arguments in everyday life. People have all kinds of ways to <clears throat> to signal the kinds of knowledge they have. For example, more in using modalities. People say so and so, probably so, or necessarily so, or I'm sure that so and so. So they have all kinds of ways to model and modelize that. <clears throat> and then finally, before I have a look at the examples, <clears throat> We also have different, because knowledge is part of this definition of the context, and contexts are the basis of the definition of different genres. 
you have genres where knowledge has special status. For example, news is about new knowledge. Many of the things we read in textbooks, again, has as a specific thing, namely to inform people about specific kinds of things. So, uh, official documents, parliamentary debates, textbooks, scientific discourse, uh, the reports and, uh, of NGOs, they have all a specific kind of definition within this context. They have about the role of knowledge in that particular kind of situation. So, one of the ways you can apply a theory of knowledge in the theory of discourse is as a component in the theory of context of different kind of genres. So genres not only have specific kinds of structures and organization and quite a lot of things, who is speaking in what kind of situation, but also the knowledge, the kind of role knowledge plays in that particular kind of situation. All right? So an interrogation of the police, for example, is a different kind of management of knowledge than, for example, just a lecture like this. I mean, they want to have knowledge other people have, or they may have knowledge and want to check it, you know? So, the def one of the definitions of a police interrogation has to do with the management of knowledge. All right, that is more or less the kind of things we talk about. Now, all, of kind, all these kind of things can be applied in critical discourse analysis as soon as we have an abuse of this particular kind of knowledge. For example, when people have epistemic power and the abuse of it, because other people don't have this particular kind of knowledge. But they are hard, the only ones who have this knowledge, and they simply say, this is so-and-so, and other people have no other ways to know, then you can abuse of this particular kind of knowledge. So you can present opinions, and also, as Tony Blair does, as knowledge. Um, you can use all kinds of tricks, like factive verbs, which suggest that something is true, which is knowledge, and in fact is not so. So you have on all the levels I'm just talking about, like for example coherence, or evidentiality, or modalities, and so you have all kinds of ways to do a critical analysis by analyzing what kind of knowledge is involved. Now a few weeks, sorry, a few minutes, to have a look at the handout. As usual, there's never time enough to do a real analysis of, of details on the handout. Um, but have a look first at the first example, Tony Blair, uh, presents a motion uh, to the um, House of Commons on March 18, 2003, more than five years ago. And part of this first mentioned are lots of presuppositions. And he says, uh, and he asks that this House is, of course, prag pragmatic, didactic expression. I'm not going to talk about millions of other things of this. There's only one thing I'm interested in how knowledge is being managed here. And he says that this House recognizes that. Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and long-range missiles and its continuing non-compliance with Security Council resolution pose a threat to international peace and security. Now, this is an enormous amount of presuppositions of what he assumes to be knowledge. All right, first of all, if he says and proposes that this house recognized, and recognized is, is a fact verb. If you say, if we recognize so and so, it means for us this is knowledge, this is true. All right? So recognize is one of these factive verbs. But it's not only. It's not only a question of this whole statement being presupposed to be true for Tony Blair, and therefore he wants Parliament to adopt that particular kind of statement, but it's full of its own presuppositions. For example, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Now this particular kind of construction, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, itself presupposes that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. All right? is again a presupposition, which he simply, in this way, sort of, he doesn't say, I claim that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, he simply presupposes it to be true. You know, so in this indirect way, he tries to get this kind of knowledge accepted, this kind of opinion, which afterwards we know was false, accepted by Parliament. And again, uh, and long-range missiles, and it's continuing non-compliance with security. Again, this again presupposes that actually Iraq did not comply and so on. So this particular kind of normalization complies, presupposes that it did not, he doesn't say it, he doesn't assert it, he presupposes it. So this whole construction itself is presupposed knowledge for him, actually, in opinion, and, he's, and he wants it to share. Now the same thing in, in B. <coughs> Again, 
knows that in 130 days since the resolution was adopted, it has not cooperated actively, unconditionally, and immediately, and so on, and so with weapons inspector, again, that is what he wants the parliament to declare, to note, which again is an effective vote. Again, again, you may say, well, maybe Iraq didn't do so, but he does say so, specifically, actively, unconditionally, and immediately. So the actual assertion is not about whether or not they didn't, but whether they didn't do so actively, immediately, and so on. So you see how he can work with the particular kind of presuppositions involved. In one C, again, to regret, again, is a effective verb. If you say, I regret so-and-so, it assumes that I know so-and-so. Again, regrets that despite sustained diplomatic effort by the Majestic's government, it has not proved possible to secure a second resolution in the UN because one permanent member of the Security Council, France, uh, may blame public its intention to use its veto, whatever, the circumstances. Again, this again is being presupposed, and again, France will probably formulate it in a different way. I mean, we see here a, one relationship between discourse and its structures and the way people define reality, and as Jonathan would call it, versions of reality. All right? So you have different versions of reality. For some people, it's just an opinion. For other people, it's knowledge. What I'm saying here is that Blair is able to manipulate the kind of knowledge he has, you know, through secret service or whatever, um, and present his opinion as knowledge. Now, the same thing, and we don't have time to do that, and we rather have a little bit of debate, uh, for the establishment of local coherence in two. Now, if you're going to try to relate, for example, to A, to B, the country and the parliamentary flag each other, and then this is a debate that, as time has gone on, has become less bit and but longer. What's the relation between the two? How will you establish the relationship between the first and the second sentence? You have to activate lots of political knowledge to know what's going on. That there were already debates in Britain about going to Iraq and so on and so on and so on. There's lots of knowledge you have to activate. People who are there, members of parliament, only understand what he says. If they activate this enormous amount of knowledge, first of all, and not only knowledge about Iraq and the whole debate in Britain, but also about the specific kind of conflict, why he, Tony Blair, is first as Prime Minister is saying so in this particular kind of situation. So they not only understand what he says, but they, only, they also understand the political point of what he says. So. All right? so when he says the country and parliament will reflect each other, that means all kinds of things. It means, for example, that parliamentaries are really democratic and listen to the people, or all kinds of other things. You know, these political implications, depending on the context, of course, are very important. Now, another thing in three, which I find very important, is that also descriptions or versions depend on the kind of knowledge you have. So, for example, Iraqi people have been brutalized by Saddam. Is that true or false? Is it knowledge? Well, I think that when Saddam Hussein or his cronies will describe it, they will not use the, the verb brutalize. They will use whatever. I don't know what they would use, but they would not use the negative verb brutalize. Now, is that an expression of knowledge or of opinion? Many people will say, well, that's how you call it. That's your version of the fact, but not my version of the fact. So, do we here deal with knowledge? Everybody would say, yes, Saddam Hussein brutalizes people. Now, is that knowledge? I don't know. Is it an opinion? It depends how you take the verb brutalize. Again, it shows that the notion of knowledge is not a, f a very clear notion. It is a fuzzy notion. The, f the relationship between actual knowledge on the one hand and opinions to brutalize is, you know, a fuzzy kind of thing. It's not like, oh, it's like this or like that. Now you have all kinds of ways of expressing this kind of thing. So this may very well be and is an expression of the mental model of Tony Blair, what happened in Iraq. And someone else has a different kind of mental model and will formulate it in a different kind of way. And not only in general, but also depends on the context. Because Tony Blair will not say the same thing in Parliament or when he is at home, all right? Uh, another thing which is also important in four is the way you can model <clears throat> how you can adapt what you say to <clears throat> the situation by giving more or less art details. So you can describe the same situation in Iraq either in very 
precise terms, like in 4A, you know, with in 1998, uh, 10,000 years of anthrax, far reaching VX, etc., etc., or in B, when you talk about the future afterwards about Iraq, and it is not so definite and precise at all. It's just all very abstract and very general political aims. So you can talk about reality and all kinds of levels of reality. And again, what is the knowledge? Well, some kinds of things are just speculation, and then you won't have this particular kind of details, and other kinds of things are just, you know, facts, historical facts, and so on. Again, what I'm saying is that you can use this knowledge in a different way to have different levels of preciseness. And then finally, in five, um, again, I say that I do not disrespect the views and opposition to mine. Now, is that knowledge? Or is it an opinion? Or is it his own self-presentation? All kinds of things. Now, the interesting thing is not only that, but if Tony Blair, as Prime Minister, says so in Parliament, what does it imply? What is the pragmatic implication? When he says so, it means, I am a democratic person. I listen to the opposition. I am not having just my ideas, as many people would accuse him to do them. He says, so when he says that, literally, it means I have I do not disrespect the views in opposition to mine, but what all people in Parliament at that moment, and also in the country, and I as an analyst, understand is, I am a person who respects the opposition, and therefore I am democratic, and therefore I am a good Prime Minister. It's a form of positive self-presentation. Is that part of the text? No. You have to infer it on the basis of the knowledge everybody has in Parliament of the political context. And only when you have make this political context explicit, you can prove this particular kind of inference. I've already talked much too long, I'm sorry.